Okay, and and we're live. Here we are at the uh, Harassus Global Meeting. Uh, I'm Bill Douglas of Gotham Private Capital. Delighted to be here uh, with Connie Wang Steele of Flywheel Associates and Metten. Uh, I'm sorry, Metten Gouverneur. 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 Uh, founding chairman of the salon in the UK, who I believe is joining us from uh, Switzerland at the moment. Yes. And um, Connie and Metin, if you don't mind, maybe you could just, uh, you know, tell us a bit about yourself to start. Sure. I guess I'll go first. <laughs> sure. um, I am a future of work and life expert. I'm an author. I run a management consultancy that's focused on business strategy and marketing to really help uh, bridge the gap in strategy and execution for growth companies. Uh, and I also happen to be a podcaster that's really um, about helping people realize meaningful fit in their work and life. Great, Connie. Thank you. And uh, welcome also to, uh, to Bill Bellows, president of InThinking, who I believe is joining us from uh, California. Um, but moving moving right along, almost in order of appearance here, Metin, maybe you can give us a bit about your background. Sure. Uh, it's been an evolutionary journey, uh, graduating as an engineer uh, from States and then evolving in London to financial sector. From there, it's become very entrepreneurial engagement, promoting London to international investors from uh, in those days, from 90s to opening the London market, uh, joining to Lord Mayor delegations to promote the city of London. Uh, real estate became very important, so we evolved with the real estate from advisory brokerage, asset management. And then after Brexit, we decided not to carry on with that. Uh, right now, we are looking at fintech investments. We are looking at um, different technologies. Uh, while this is all going on, I have another platform that I created as the I specialize in non-specialization that is focusing on uh, creative industries. It's the Salon, which is a top leadership platform that is focusing on impact. And at the same time, we have Syndicate that is focusing on the deal flow. So it's a bit of looking at the next decade and adapting to the, you know, um, into the markets accordingly. Excellent. Thank you, Medin. And uh, Bill Bellows. Hey, good morning. Hey, um, I have uh, degrees in mechanical engineering and started work as a heat transfer engineer working on uh, jet engines and did that for seven years. And there I got exposed to um, Japanese ideas on quality improvement and changed careers to move to uh, Los Angeles to work for Rocketdyne, a major manufacturer of rocket engines, including the Space Shuttle Man engine, and worked there for 26 years. And and I, although I was brought in to bring in what I call tools and techniques of quality improvement, what I became more fascinated with is uh, concepts and strategies and the thinking side. And so I, I retired from there and uh, went to work for the W. Edwards Deming Institute, a nonprofit formed by famous Dr. Deming, did that for two and a half years. And now I'm on my own. I uh, consult for a few clients and also teach online courses and uh, with tools and techniques and concepts and strategies that involve, uh, it's a lot about nimbleness. So good morning. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, nimbleness. That is uh, a big part of our, our theme here. Um, I will just uh, kind of recap the theme of this of this session for for everyone's benefit. Transforming a, f a firm to be nimble gradually as a firm grows, it becomes set in its ways of working. It was not designed to be as efficient as it could be. It is not only the operational processes that need to be revived, but the staff too. How can nimble be designed and put into place? Does it need an explosive change or perhaps in, in a, a parallel change? How to alter the mindset of resisting staff? perhaps even how to persuade the CEO to change. And uh, uh, Connie, I think you had some some thoughts about uh, how Nimble can be designed and put into place. Feel free to, uh, to share. Sure. I think to be a Nimble firm really means you have to be agile in business. How do you become agile in business? It starts with people. So uh, as somebody who's very passionate about understanding how people think and do, what drives them. Uh, what's really important to understand is that to facilitate a level of agility, it starts with creating an environment that really welcomes experimentation. It is one that creates psychological safety for them, because many times the reason why people don't want to change, things tend to be rigid, is because fundamentally there is that fear. 
the fear of change, fear of shame, the anxiety that comes with that. So really kind of getting to that root cause around why that is the case. Many times it may be because the environment is such that it doesn't reward testing, learning, and iterating, much like more progressive organizations where they believe that this mindset, a growth mindset of being able to try new things is really embraced. So for me, so much of being able to shift to being nimble starts with understanding the people within your organization and why there is this resistance in the first place and guiding them, helping them realize that there is the opportunity to benefit from trying something new, assuming the culture is one that is able to deliver that. People, culture, uh, meds and or bill, by all means, feel free to chime in. I'll go. Um, I, from my perspective, I, want, I like to look at a sensational organization that can be in its own evolution to understand. Being understood in life is one of the most important things. And therefore, sense of belonging, sense of appreciation, and sense of accomplishment needs to be the ingredients to become a nimble organization. In the journey, one thing that is common denominator to all of us, we are all born to our mothers. From there, we evolve and develop our own individuality within a family environment. Then we make friends. Then we compete with colleagues. And then we have acquaintances. And we have a community. And we grow in this so that the life journey uh, finds the competitiveness of the or collaborative mindset of the colleagues in an organization that can be very commercial, entrepreneurial. It can be a foundation and a voluntary. So the culture of getting people to collaborate starts with mutual respect. And if you can develop that, and then there's a sense of belonging and sense of ownership, a sense of leadership at the individual level, instead of directorship that is being a dictatorship, there will be a huge blessing in the energy of the company, the culture, the motivation, the processes, the technology, the market positioning, uh, prospecting, marketing. All these languages will flow in a synchronicity. We develop a culture that it's, uh, I believe this is something that I'm researching at the moment, that it's a culture about I am because we are. And my philosophy is we are consciously empowered to empower in our being, living, giving to grow to our full potential, both individually and collectively, by integrating philosophical, entrepreneurial, and philanthropic values. So based on that, I think that we have a good culture. We have learned a lot along the way. We have different people that bring their own personality, which we have to uh, understand and uh, develop. So this is not the perfect world, but it's something that we like, uh, this energy in our culture. Great, Madden, thank you. and. Uh... Uh, it's interesting, two out of three panelists here have a background in, uh, in, in, in engineering, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> yes. You can bring that to this, uh, to this discussion, Bill? Yeah, um, I agree with everything um, we've heard, and I just add to that. Um, I think we join organizations, whether it's a new organization. Well, I think when organizations start, they're filled with people with great excitement. That under, I think um, that's one thing. Two is I think, I think we're all excited to be part of something bigger. And I think that's a, a natural thing that we're that we learn. But here's what happens: um, we we go to school, and we and and we're assigned grades as an individual, right? So I, I don't know anyone who's ever taken an exam with four or five other people. We take exams individually, all based on the premise that the exam is a measure of me. And and so I point out to students in my class that I said, you know, when I when I ask. If I was, you know, if Bill, you were, if, if you were a student in one of my class and I said, Bill, how did you do on the exam? And I asked the students, I said, so what does that question say about my relationship to Bill? And they'll say, oh, he cares about Bill. He's, he's sincere. And I said, well, what it also implies is that I am separate from Bill. So if I asked you, how are you doing in sales? I didn't say, how are we doing in sales? I said, how are you doing in sales? So if I say, how did you do on the exam? I did not say, how did we do on the exam? And so I throw this out because our inherent thinking, even though we love to be part of something big, we're led to believe that the grade is caused by me alone, that the instructor had nothing to do with it. And what I point out is that when I ask you, Bill, how did you do on the exam? 
that makes me an observer of your learning, not a participant. Hmm. And how can we have teamwork if we're going around as observers? And so I think what happens is we come into organizations and we adopt this observer mindset, which is part of our culture. And so we're, we go to school thinking we caused the grade, we get into sports, we think we won the game. So I say, how can we have teamwork if our fundamental thinking is about being an observer of others as opposed to a participant? Mm-hmm. This creates rigidity because when I screw up, it's not how did we screw up, it's how did I screw up. And so that's what I would say is that's what I focus on is from where comes the thinking that I did it myself. If we could, have, so in, in my courses, I, I assign grades to students. I have to, that's part of the system. Um, and I find I have a variety of ways to compensate, but if it was up to me, we would not be grading students. We would not do performance appraisals. <laughs> we abandon them because they're, they're fundamentally about individuals. And I'd say, how can you have agility and nimbleness if we're fixated on individuals? So I just throw that out. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's that's pretty 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 interesting, Bill. And I'm sure we can bring a lot of the lesson your lessons you're learning from uh, as an academic into uh, you know into the executive suite uh, suite as well. Um, one question we might kind of uh, um, throw out there as well is you know where where are these root causes? You know, um, you know where does the lack of nimbleness kind of uh, uh, come from, and I think you know, Bill, you sort of alluded to that just now. But uh, Connie, maybe you'd like to address that. Well, so I had mentioned earlier that a lot of the root cause of this lack of nimbleness, the ability to just try something, right? In order to be nimble, you have to be willing to pivot and adapt to change. We as humans, a lot of times, don't want to change. <laughs> Where we want to stay in somewhat of a steady state, but the reality is that change is constant. In the environment that we're in today, uncertainty is the new certainty. We have change and uncertainty in almost every level of our life, on the macro sense of the world, right? Because of everything that's going on, we also have change within our workplace due to the pandemic. But even that was happening beforehand as a result of technology. You know, the speed of business has accelerated so much, but in turn, that's also made our lives personally, uh, accelerate at a certain momentum. So when you have all these varying factors at the same time, it creates a lot of angst for people. And so people want predictability. People want stability, dependability. And so to encourage that sense of change is good, change is better, you will learn through change, you have to show people that there is a benefit to them as well as that benefit to the company. And it needs to start small. Change doesn't happen as a big bang. Mm -hmm. So when leaders say, we want to pivot into this new area because there's a huge opportunity for us to take advantage of, therefore go, folks can't conceptualize that. But, and, and, and people want proof too, because they have so much going on that they're trying to accomplish. But if you can demonstrate and start small, just like, Many software companies, it's all about agile development. You start small, you iterate, you show proof, you learn, you adapt, and you just because you have ongoing input to make it better because nobody knows right out of the gate what's exactly going to work and what's not. But when people feel invested, everybody's aligned on the common purpose, they can see the benefits themselves because they've been part of building that out. Then it encourages a shift in culture and shift in mindset and shift in operation because they've been part of that process and they are creating that approach, that methodology together to build an environment that's much more nimble. Mm-mm. Great. Very true. Thanks, Connie. Matt? Maybe uh, we're all driven by um, passion and purpose. And then we look at our performance and we relate to other people. So this can be, I mean, I have examples when I was in a large New York, uh, very large uh, automotive sector, and I was an engineer, and I was basically in one department, and I was very proactive trying to create other values uh, or other initiatives within the organization, but I was always taught by a manager, this is your job, this is what you do, don't touch anything else. And I said, okay, I won't do that. I respect that, etc. Then I was observing the manager under, and I said uh, he was much more open to the ideas that we had. So we kind of created a 
think tank together. And we said, let's, let's just spend time to evaluate how the company can grow. And we ended up opening the Hong Kong for the company through this initiative uh, by just collaborating with the other manager. And the manager who was telling me, he said, okay, you guys are doing better now. It's okay, et cetera. So it was just a way not to take the ultimate order, uh, respect that, but try to be proactive respectfully to add value as well. So this is something I don't take it easily. Somebody says, don't do that. And then because it's their own um, ego, then I, I would say that uh, some people should try to find out what is the common goal, and then, then you can act to that. And that creates uh, something that I like is that you look at shared values and then voice, then you can voice because you understand the values. Then you have vision because you are now able to define the vision together. Look at the resources that you are sharing and utilizing, and then that gives you building a community. So because you are aligning all the way from the values to create some, whether it's an initiative, whether it's a project, whether it's a client relationship, so that by understanding values, it could be a business to business relationship, but you need to understand that organization values, what is driving them. Then you can understand how to communicate with them. And then you can share a vision, even a small, big, whatever it is, even if it's a transactional or one deal, you are sharing a vision on something. It could be a product level, it could be a market expression, uh, it could be a charitable event, uh, contribution. So I think understanding each other and then respecting each other is not the easiest thing, uh, but it's the important area for us to develop ourselves. And um, another thing I believe that I think as we evolve in our maturity, uh, Philosophically, we develop, develop our own philosophy and we can define our identity. And one thing I notice and is increasing is the consciousness and the conscious leadership and adaptive leadership is important in the organizations because if you are not conscious of what's going on around, especially in fast changing and transforming world, then you will be very static uh, or you will be very localized, localized and not necessarily um, acting in a much more inclusive manner. So there's a lot that we can learn. One expression that I learned to grow, to uh, appreciate, we are synchronized to meet one another, to bring the best in each other through the toolbox in the making. So we just keep more tools into our toolbox to develop ourselves individually and collectively. So I like creating philosophies and uh, perspectives uh, as we go on. And then I think we find very unique relationships along the way. I will be attending to Davos in the next three days. There will be 80 meetings there. We will see what's going on. And we will hear the whole perspective of the geopolitics, the innovation, the young generation. It will be very interesting to see after you know, five years, what, does this, uh, what is the message there? Hopefully, it's a productive one. It's an inclusive one and not attacking and finger pointing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, certainly hope so too, Metin. Uh, Bill, any, uh, any, anything to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A um, few things come to mind based on what we've just heard is, um, it, it's all about consciousness. And, and so my work is help, about helping people become more aware of their thinking. And, and so I find at home, we have, at home, we understand things as a system. At home, when we go to the supermarket and we sort through the oranges, we're looking for the one which is the ripest, the juiciest. At work, the mindset is all the oranges that meet requirements are interchangeable. That everything which is which meets a set of requirements, they're all good. And so I find it fascinating is why at home do we sort through the oranges and at work treat oranges as interchangeable parts, just as we treat every part of a rocket engine as an interchangeable part. What's what's missing a, a pony, Connie brought out is, is at home we inherently know that the orange is part of our breakfast. At work it's a part. And so if we have a, how can we, again it goes back to teamwork, how can we have teamwork if we view things as interchangeable parts and not part of? What's missing is the of. At mm -hmm. home the of is natural. We know when we're buying the cleaning supplies it's part of what we're doing. At work somebody says, Go get cleaning solutions. So I go off and get the cheapest stuff I can find because I'm not paying attention to the use. So at home, our use is natural. So what I find is I, I give people examples and show them whether it's cutting a piece of wood, being really close to that line. At work, we cut anywhere in between two lines and treat them as interchangeable. So it's about consciousness, viewing things as part of. And, and then uh, another thing I wanted to throw out is um, at work, we treat learning as absolute. You know, so I'll say, well, I know this. 
what I find with students in my classes is we need to treat learning as relative. That my understanding is, oh, how, again, how can we have continual improvement with a mindset of black and white, I know this, as opposed to my learning can be improved, which allows for things going wrong. I learn from that. At work, we treat learning as failure. At home, we treat, well, even at home, we can get into that mindset. But if we have a, a mindset of viewing things in a relative way and not an absolute way, we can go a lot further with nimbleness. Beautiful. Great, great, Bill. And, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move back for a minute to uh, uh, a, a couple of, of Connie's comments that uh, resonated with me. You know, change needs to start small, iterate, show proof, um, and on from there. And it, uh, it takes me back a little bit to the descriptor of this, of this session, you know, how to alter the mindset of resisting staff. And then, you know, it, as, he, as, as Frank put it in the descriptor, perhaps even how to persuade the, she, the CEO to change. So, um, you know, if, if change needs to kind of start small and uh, have a bit of a groundswell from the bottom, you know, where does the a, a executive management come in and how can they sort of um, empower uh, staff and team members to adopt more of a mindset of, uh, of nimbleness for the benefit of the, the whole organization. Any, 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 anyone want to comment there, Connie, perhaps? I think definitely it starts at the leadership level, but obviously mm-hmm. you can start from the bottom up, but it is really getting to know your people, understanding what are their triggers, what is causing them angst, what is that, what is causing those barriers for them to want to move forward. It is building that human connection, that deeper relationship, that investment with people. Uh, Because we all know when we understand one another better, we have not just the common vision, mission, purpose, and what we're trying to do. When we're aligned on that, it's then what is inhibiting you from moving forward. And sometimes it's not capabilities. It has nothing to do with skills. It has something to do with them personally that could be limiting them from moving forward and getting to that, understanding the why behind it can unleash opportunities and solutions to be able to look at a problem differently. And it may be something that is more emotional in nature versus something that's very rational in nature. But it it starts with having that uh, one-on-one to some degree conversation with the CEO with their team and understanding where do you feel you are going to be challenged with starting to change things? What can we do? Could we be misaligned on the objectives, the goal approaches or something even deeper? Once you get to that, then you can start to solve what the challenges could be. But similarly, for those who are managers, many employees don't feel that their managers are invested in their development, that there is a right way and a wrong way. So to Bill's point, it's black and white, that they should do it in this particular fashion because they know they will be rewarded accordingly. They will be able to move forward in the right way. Nobody wants to mess up. But if there is a environment that is open, that creates that psychological safety, that can demonstrate that in this type of new approach, this is how we're going to be able to accelerate faster, you know, have that necessary speed to market and velocity to achieve what we want to achieve in a different way and show examples of it and show it in a way such that you could do short experiments. Again, experimentation versus right or wrong is a way to help do that. But it again, starts with, if you think of this, how do you create that strategic plan individually with people to know, okay, where are we aligned? Where are we misaligned? How can we start to work towards a specific path uh, and break that into small pieces such that we can move past it and then becomes habitual and then it becomes iterative. So to me, so much of that does have to start at a very human level because with all this technology, with all this focus on automating things, you know, just trying to be as productive and efficient as possible, I feel that we've lost the importance of being connected with one another and ensuring that we can support one another to be really successful in all facets. Yeah, and you know, maybe maybe um, some of that losing that sense of connection has been symptomatic of our times, right? The, the the pandemic, working from home, 
uh, than just sort of dipping a toe back into coming to the office, uh, learning this, figuring out this new way of, of working together, et cetera. And um, nobody gets the answer. That's the thing that I think people assume, do I have to have the answer? No one really has the answer. So to be vulnerable mm-hmm. and say, look, we are working collectively together to figure out what fits us best because one approach for one organization is going to be different than another because the composition of the people are going to be different. So the culture is going to be different. So it's really a matter about finding people, company fit, just like you hear product market fit. You have to establish that. And that requires experimentation that isn't fixed in any way, shape or form. It can't be in the way that businesses have to be agile now and, and to create that rate of change that you need to be competitive, you can't be fixed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. Um, points. Yeah, Matt, absolutely, please. Sure. I think, I love the points uh, <laughs> all, all around that is going on uh, in the panel. I think the CEO, if you look at it from that point, has two hats. One has to report to the board and understand what the board is passing on, what expectations they have, and then they have, he has to look at the team, or he has to look at the team and understand their competence, the, the targets, the size, uh, whether they have systems, uh, he will have a budget, and he will say, what is the priority of the budget? And then there's pressure of if it's a sales organization, you know, they have targets to meet. If it's technology, they have patterns to organize. So the CEO, depending on their uh, sector, will have different uh, emotional intelligence requirements for himself or herself, as well as the emotional intelligence for each individual member and the teams or departments as you see them fit. So that needs to create a, a values base uh, to be able to communicate that can be trusted. And I don't think trust is enough. In my view, trust and no doubt is the only way forward, which is not easy to maintain because trust is a bit lonely. But if you have trust and no doubt, then you are able to create a culture that can be uh, trusted, reliable, and I think that's important. Also, uh, in a culture uh, that is productive uh, and adaptive, you need to have a a mentor-to-mentor relationship because every single person will need to be receiving a mentorship in the way that they feel understood, and then you can create your peer-to-peer relationship. It could be uh, peer-to-peer, CEO-to-CEO in a business, it could be peer-to-peer CEO and engineer talking about a project because they need to feel that they can talk in that language. Then you look at deal-to-deal or situation uh, that arises, you reach out to many because the goal is to be collective and, and be one organization and be, uh, I call it uh, composure. You need to have a posture as an organization or individual to create a composure, to create an exposure. So it's got three levels of Continuity, And therefore, uh, the CEO's role to make a difference needs to be different himself, herself, to be able to relate to each person and uh, on a very unique understanding of the common goal. And then if they have a not clear understanding, then it takes time. So you can never say, I told you so, where's your result? I told you so, and finger pointing will get you nowhere. And that's where the world is getting in a bit more inefficient because I told you so, and finger pointing increased. And where you have many successful VCs, and one organization that I highly respect is still 1,000 year old organization, is the CTO Corporation, City of London Corporation, that has been there for 1,000 years and plus. That there's a Lord Mayor each year in November that is elected with a huge ceremony in London, that this particular mayor is responsible for the one square mile of the city of finance and is responsible of promoting UK, London, in the financial services sector and is treated as an MP and travels around the world and it has 250 speeches on a regular basis, promoting in a very professional, in a very global mindset. So we look at it and you say, wow, there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of city, there's a lot, but there's a system that has been respected. And every year, one qualified person that takes a decade for them probably to prepare to be elected, it, it goes ahead. And then when you go to different countries, you are respected as you're receiving because there's a collaborative mindset. I joined that many times and I was very privileged to and humble to really learn from the peers at that time. And you say, wow, this organization earns already respect because its continuity has a legacy. And I think that's special to learn. There's many organizations of such, but this was very unique one to see that it can still be corporate, but it's got the most humble approach in becoming the Lord Mayor. It takes a lot to be, get there. Uh, it's not just uh, because you name 
you have to work hard to get to that position. So it's nice to learn from those kind of organizations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Bill, feel free to share any any of your thoughts on uh, on how a CEO can uh, in, in empower um, team members to uh, to affect change and uh, and uh, and uh, shifted mindset in an organization. Yeah, I would say it's um, it's not about empowering. And what, what are you, you go to work and we say we want to empower you. Well, an organization that blames me, um, you know, because I'm having trouble learning or whatever that is, you know, and we create this, this sense of isolation that causes, that, that I think leads, that loses agility and nimbleness is, um, again, you know, if, if you're having trouble learning, Bill, you know, as your professor, I have to take responsibility and your classmates need to feel responsibility, but we don't. We look at things in isolation. And, and so as a result, then we get people that, that, that are waiting to be told what to do step by step. We'll follow the instructions diligently not to get blamed. And if things go wrong, they're blamed anyway. So in that environment, what we end up doing is, is having people come in with great excitement. They then become reserved. And now we say, I want to empower you. Well, if we didn't have environments that disempowered people, we wouldn't have to empower them. <laughs> so <laughs> the whole mindset of empowering people is giving is is what we're doing is we're taking that power away, and now we're giving it back to. Well, what if we never took it away? Um, we treat leadership as exclusive. So again, how can I be innovative if I'm told because I'm not a manager, I'm not a leader? I think most books on leadership imply in order to be a leader, you have to be a manager. But if we treat leadership as the ability to create a path to move forward with new software, new hardware, new designs, if we treat leadership as inclusive, again, I'm not saying you know, there's not a place for a manager, but I think if we treated leadership as inclusive, we'd have a greater opportunity. I think part of the challenge is having environments where learning is relative, where leadership is inclusive. And stop treating leadership, again, I don't have a problem with an executive, but as soon as we start to treat leadership and, and management as one and the same, then what we're saying to people is do as you're told. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, I like your uh, the the rebellious rather rebellious spirit that's shining <laughs> through in some of your comments. Phil. I love the word empower, but in this case, I love your word better in the meaning that you gave it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about empowering the way you said. I love it. I agree. No, well, I I, think um... To both of your points of the empowerment, which really is about this in level of investment that leadership needs to have now in their people. It wasn't the case before. It was sort of this hierarchical structure. However, if you look at the changing demographics of the people in the workforce, millennials in particular want to have a seat at the table. They don't believe in these hard and fast hierarchies. They want to be able to be invested and aligned in the purpose, mission, and vision of the company and are choosing specifically those companies that fit with what they personally believe in. So it's not about achieving money, title, and power for them. It is being aligned with that mission and purpose and having the right culture that enables them to contribute. So I think that's important to take note of is that to create a nimble organization, start looking at the generation of people that you have, those that are millennials and younger by default are quite agile and nimble themselves because they've grown up in a world where they have technology powering their lives. They can test and learn and try and add new apps and explore things and take courses and so forth. And they constantly want to learn and grow and talent stack. For them, it is about breadth, not depth. Absolutely. So when you have a large cohort of your workforce who's actually ready to go. However, the very traditional structures are about operating in a very industrialized sort of line way of working. So the stage gate, 
get this done, then hand it to the next person, then hand it to the next person. It needs to be right. It's not really the way the world works anymore. Mm -hmm. So it is shifting management style to align to that. Um, but you know, to Metzen's point about having the emotional intelligence, leaders have to now care in a different way. They have to read people, understand, almost have a sixth sense of how people are thinking and feeling, particularly now in a hybrid work world. You're not going to be physically able to sense how your workforce is operating because you're not all going to be there. You have a global workforce that you want to have the best talent all over the world. But that requires a leader to have a different level of investment, of investment in understanding their people, getting to know them as people, understanding what motivates them, not just what motivates them at work, what motivates them in their life, because work mm -hmm. and life are now completely intertwined. Yeah. When you know that, when you know it gets them excited, inevitably people want to try. Mm -hmm. They're going to be much more creative, much more innovative. But that you increases the sense of belonging. That Absolutely. Part of the, uh, the culture. Yeah. 100% because you need belonging. You need a sense of agency too. They need to be themselves. If people can't be themselves, and you're also seeing that shift too, that people just want to be their whole selves. They don't want to compartmentalize. So to Bill's point, you know, you feel isolated. I have to operate a one way at work and I could be myself at home. It's not the way of the future anymore. People just want to be themselves no matter where they are, right? So that's also part of pulling out this ability to be nimble is because when people can feel like they can be themselves, they'll go. They'll be willing to go when they're completely aligned on what it is that they need to do. I love the points. Just one thing came in my mind, if I can, Bill. Absolutely, man. Just uh, imagine the 80s. Um, and it was like so exciting. I remember Nancy Reagan going on the TV and we used to go on the aerobics, like, come on. Let's do this because we are changing. And I'm talking a thousand people just doing this kind of, I'm talking early 80s. You move on another decade, another decade, and there was an ambition, whatever, uh, or 70s was different, 60s was different. You look at decade by decade, and now there's a decade of the last two that actually the next gen, as we call them, they are now looking at the meaning and uh, more than the, so that the, what is the impact that you're creating? And we are being blamed as, as a generation that created a lot of problems for them from environment, from technology, from culture, from mindset, etc., or geopolitics. So there's a lot of accountability that the next gen is holding against us as our generation and to, to say, what's your purpose and did you really achieve it in a productive manner? So don't tell me that you know better because I now give different relativity to what it is that I'm trying to do so I have different measurement on my goals and achievements and etc. So it's not the usual transactional language as such. We created a, a, a club together with a university called CKGBS, uh, which basically is called Impact 17 Plus One Club. And we ask on that to uh, individuals uh, that basically, what does impact mean to you? So that they come in 60 seconds, they tell what does impact mean to them? What what, that's a lot in 60 seconds to say, you know, uh, how you're going to change the world, what's going on, how you want to lead, etc., etc. And it's been amazing to see, this has been going on about a year and a half, it's amazing to see different people coming and expressing themselves authentically in 60 seconds because it's their voice, it's the way they want to do it, it's what they mean, so what does impact mean to you? Uh, is made me realize that we have a whole new decade ahead that is going to look very different. Uh, from the last few. Well, I'm sure you're right about that. Well, adaptive leadership will be required. <laughs> so um, listen, we have about five more minutes and I'm, I'm uh, pleased to share we've uh, received a question from, from the audience uh, from Venkant Maturi, Management Advisor, and I'll read it. I'll um, um, edit it a bit uh, for, for my own clarity. Uh, he frames it as a contrarian question. Uh, he says, as work and home integrate transactionally, should we actually underemphasize work and let go of the desire to, quote, motivate and engage employees? Uh, and should we respect employees' wisdom to give as much importance as they wish, as they wish to give to their work? In other words, um, well, I, I, I don't need to rephrase it. I, I think it, 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 you can, you can pull some, uh, 
feel free to answer either of those uh, related questions. Well, I would say they, they, they organizations that empower people are the same organizations that have to motivate people. I tell you, if we didn't demotivate them, we wouldn't need to motivate them. If we didn't disempower them, we wouldn't have to empower them. So I think the, the and the, and the issue is that the people that demotivate them, you know, through telling them what to do and they go off and diligently do it, and um, are the same people that then saying, well, why do we have a workforce was disengaged because you're giving grades to students, so you give performance appraisals and I measure you as an individual. And then I'm wondering why I'm disempowering. I don't, I don't realize I am disempowering. That question, how did you do in sales, is a disempowering question. So I think if we, if we shift in our mindset from, you know, and, and so essentially realize as an executive, why am I in your way? <laughs> so if I change my questioning from how are you doing to how are we doing and have that mindset in the organization, I think you don't, then these questions change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I say is um, I, I like to use this very simple system, a bottle and a cap. This could be two software elements, two parts of an airplane. And what we do, and we, we have what I refer to as me organizations where I assign grades to individuals and I say, is the cap done? What the cap is done means it meets requirements. What's missing from meeting requirements, letter grade wise, is anywhere between a D minus and an A plus. Mm-hmm. And so if, I, if I'm on the receiving end of a D minus and a D minus, then I'm having trouble getting them together. Then I call up Connie and I say, Connie, there's a problem with the cap. But she says, no, the cap met requirements. Well, disempowered Connie gives me a D minus. How is that helping me? <laughs> Metton does the same thing with a bottle. And so I'm stuck trying, because these are not parts they're part of. We miss the of. Miss the of. Okay. Any, any quick uh, comments or sound bites anyone would like to share? We only have uh, about three minutes. Can you please come? To me that when leaders understand what people what people's goals are at, at work and in their life, look at an individual holistically. Right? Because also another thing to take into consideration is that the younger generation in particular doesn't separate the two. What they want to do in their career, some of it may not be an, in the job that they have. Many are parallel pathing, side hustles, have a lots of entrepreneurial endeavors. So you can holistically understand what are you trying to accomplish? How does the role that you have with us benefit where you want to go? How do we mutually help each other? Because if your goal is to start your own company, for example, and this is a valuable way where you can learn and we can learn from you, you know, when you kind of zoom out and see strategically where did they want to go and that really is their motivator you have a different conversation of how you can get them to think creatively and what's interesting is that these various side hustles that they have and again i'm speaking to a certain cohort right now but i think it's actually quite reflective of where things are going there's a way that you could leverage that breadth and depth of expertise and bring that into the fold to help you think fundamentally differently on how you approach a problem. Mm-hmm. But we have a tendency, as Bill said, you look in isolation. What can you do for me in this particular role? In Do these requirements right now? So you're forcing a very narrow way of thinking. And so your scope becomes very narrow. You're not unleashing the ability for somebody to really bring all their potential in a job. Mm-hmm. Just to comment, I think, to the answer, uh, the, the working from home, in my view, increased the sense of ownership, although you are not in the office as the usual thing, but every member in our team has owned the space, agree what needs to be done. Uh, they're leading, they become leader of their own project or initiative that they are doing. So it's been really increasing the mutual respect. They can go to office when they choose, they can come, but there's an overall responsibility to align and act together to get the necessary things. Sometimes it's very urgent thing and uh, can't even go home. Sometimes you can go from home and separate yourself from the family and say it's priority. So it, I think it's been relearning how to live at home and at work. And I think one thing that we evolve in the society and growing in any industry, in my view, project is the boss. Uh, trust and no doubt, resonate to the heart, and go shoulder to shoulder to each situation so that it becomes a mutually respectful, solution-oriented movement. 
Thank you, Medden. And, and uh, listen, with that, we're, uh, we're out of time. Um, but I just want to thank uh, Frank Jorgen Richter and Harassus for hosting this session. And of course, want to uh, extend warm thanks to our illustrious panel, uh, Connie Steele of Flywheel Associates, Bill Bellows of InThinking, and Metten Gouverneur of uh, the Salon. Uh, thank you all. It's been a, a, a very um, enjoyable, educational, and uh, illuminating session for me, and I think uh, will be will be for others who can watch it on the the replay. Thank you all very much. Delighted to meet you, and can't wait to be hugging in the real real <laughs> events. Yes, <laughs> hugs out the best. Okay. All the best. Great time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.